Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Good morning, John. I like to pick on him. Good morning. It's uh, time for us to begin our worship service here at uh, Strickland Church of Christ. We're honored that you're here, uh, whether you're in person here or in the old auditorium or the new auditorium or whether you're online with us. Uh, we're thankful that you've uh, chosen to be with us this morning and hope that you'll pray. I uh, hope and pray that you'll be with us at every opportunity that uh, you might have. Um, later on, we'll go through all the Zoom classes. I think I said that last week, and then I forgot to do them, so uh, I'll, try to, I'll try to remember. I, I must have been in a hurry to get somewhere. I'm not sure, but I'll try to remember to do them today. Uh, before we dismiss, just as a reminder, I, I know they're on the uh, PowerPoint, uh, but I'll uh, try to do them as a reminder for everyone. Those participating in services this morning, Billy Rainey will have our uh, song service. Uh, Dwayne Ellis will have our opening prayer. Michael Hickman, our scripture reading. Brad, our sermon. Uh, David Now will be uh, presiding over the Lord's table, and then I'll have the closing prayer as well as a few closing announcements. Uh, I know the sick were on our uh, uh, PowerPoint this morning. I just wanted to mention some of those that we mentioned last week. Bill Jones, uh, remember him, Samuel uh, Raju, uh, Doyle Now, and Karen Weaver, and then those that are on our uh, announcements for today. Remember all of those uh, as well. And don't forget, uh, Lawrence's Zoom class uh, started this past Thursday night. be going on again this Thursday at 7 p.m., uh, if you want to be a part of that, please get him your information so that he can add you to the Zoom class. Uh, see him, or um, we can get his phone number for you if you're online and you need to get that information to him. Uh, birthdays this week. Uh, happy birthday on the 24th, or 21st to Nick Harris and Elsie Miller. Happy birthday on the 24th to Harold Moore. Happy birthday on the 26th to Casey Hopkins, Gary Walden, and Kate Strickland. And then uh, happy anniversary this week on the 21st to Dennis and Elsie uh, Miller. I have a couple of cards uh, to read for you. Uh, the family of Kenneth Hopkins acknowledges with great appreciation your kind expression of sympathy. Thank you for the donation made in memory of our loved one, Kenneth. It means a lot to all the family in our time of grief. I also have a thank you. Uh, dear Strickland family, thank you for the gift of Pine Vale in memory of my mother, Martha Jones. She had a special place in her heart for children. Also, thanks for the many uh, cards you sent her during her time in the nursing home. Uh, love, Sister Barbara Hammer. Uh, thank you from um, Patsy Wilson. Thank you for the contribution to Pine Vale and Jimmy's memory. He had a special place in his heart uh, for them, and thanks uh, for uh, Sister Patsy, and a note here I wanted to read to you, Sister Patsy just jotted this at the top that many of you may not have known. Uh, Jimmy donated the concrete blocks for the foundation of the first Pineville location. He and Ural Wade carried them down uh, to the site one load at a time. So that's, uh, that's a, a good piece of history. Thank you, Miss Patsy, for sharing that with us. So many uh, things to be thankful, God above, for his rich blessings and to so many friends and neighbors like each one of you are for the prayers, phone calls, texts, and visits, uh, emails, etc. Thank you for the support during my illness and setbacks. And Christian love, John Stevens. So we'll get all these on the board for everyone. If there's something you need me to announce, then just get me a note and we'll get that before we're uh, dismissed today.
This morning I'll be reading from Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and looked down on everyone else. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee was standing and praying like this about himself God I thank you that I am not that I am not like the other people greedy unrighteous adulterers or even like this tax collector I fast twice a week I give a tenth of everything I get but the tax collector standing far off would not even raise his eyes to heaven but kept striking his chest and saying God have mercy on me a sinner I tell you this is this one went down to his house justified rather than the other because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled but the one who humbles himself will be exalted let's pray together dear lord we thank you for this day and all the blessings that go with it by your continuous care for us. We pray that we'll always praise you, honor you, and trust you to do in our lives what needs to be done. And we're thankful for the promise of life hereafter. If we walk by faith, are cleansed by the blood of your Son, that we do whatever you ask us to do in order to come in contact with that blood. We thank you, Lord, for that great sacrifice that he made for us. We're mindful of those who are hurting this morning, those who are sick, those we've just mentioned. We pray that Becky Holdham's procedure will Bring good news. Pray for Charlie Doss. That Bill Jones will get better and feel better. The door now will have better days ahead. For Karen Weaver, for Sarah Vanderford and her heart procedure, her heart surgery. We're thankful that. John Stevens is better and feeling better these days, and we pray you continue to bless him with good health. Others that are on the list, we pray that you'll help them to have the good and perfect gift of healing in their lives. We pray for spiritual healing for those who are faint-hearted and those of us who slip and fall from time to time and we pray for those who are wayward those who were once members of your body and now are still members but they're unfaithful and we pray that you restore them to faithfulness help us to do and say whatever needs to be said to encourage them to do that we pray the borders of thy kingdom will be, will be broadened and that you'll give the increase in this community and beyond. That you'll bless those that we support in the missionary fields and others that we would like to but cannot. But we pray for them to continue to preach thy word 
under difficult circumstances, especially in countries where COVID-19 is so rampant. Pray that you'll help us to overcome the hardships that COVID-19, the virus, has brought upon us. That you'll get us back to a more normal way of life according to your will. And we'll be able to shake hands and hug each other again. We know that you can, but we don't always know what your will is. May good come from the bad. May you providentially guide those who are in positions of leadership that your will may be done. That you'll restore America to a more influential role in the world, that you'll be with world leaders as they come together, that you'll bring peace upon the earth according to your will. We're thankful for all the love that we have for each other. Help us to love and encourage one another, to respect our, our leaders, our elders, our deacons who serve. We're thankful for Brad and Terry as they preach the word. And for Lawrence and all those who teach your word in the classes, we pray that you'll help them to be strong. Help us to study your word, to love it, to use it in our lives the best that we can. Thank you, Lord. Help us to walk by faith that we may hear those wonderful words at the end of this life and at in the judgment, well done, good and faithful servant. Help us to always keep the attitude of the penitent tax collector. Be humble before you and always ask for your mercy and show your mercy to others. In Jesus' name, amen.
times we share together heartaches and sighs. Sometimes we dream together of how it will be when we all get to heaven, God's family. And though some go before us, we'll all meet again, and just inside the city, as we enter in, there'll be no more party, with Jesus will be together. Sometimes we laugh together, sometimes we cry, sometimes we share together heartaches and sighs, sometimes we dream together of how it will be when we all get Please turn to Matthew chapter 16 with me this morning. We're going to look at, uh, in particular, at verse um, 24. I'm sorry, we're going to begin with the, our main text of our lesson will begin with 24, and 26 will be the key verse that we'll, that we'll look at. We've looked at this verse, and I've no telling how many sermons I've mentioned it in over the years, and maybe even preached entire lessons on it, and I'm not going to do an oldie but goodie today, but I'll, there's some, some thoughts I want to share with you about this as we as we think about this particular verse. So while you get your Bible situated, I would ask you to, to remember me and your prayers this week and my mom. Um, I'm scheduled for a colonoscopy and an EGD on Tuesday morning early. I have to be in Tupelo at 6.15. And, I mean, I'm an old hand at doing that. Um, the, you know, I don't really dread the procedure. Um, my concern is my mom and the fact that the night before I'm going to be somewhat, as you well know, incapacitated and I'm the only one that can run the lift by myself or, and so how we'll get her situated, she's going to have to go to bed early and she don't like to do that and she's going to have to stay in the bed late until I can get back home from Tupelo and, uh, and so the logistics of all that and dealing with the night before um, and I, I already put this off once. I was supposed to go into, and actually in, in April, and because of the pandemic, they weren't doing them. And that was my five-year limit, and I had three little polyps five years ago, or five and a half years ago, and so I need to follow this up. And, uh, and so in the process of all of that, um, I rescheduled it for this week, and I decided, you know, I'm, I need to go on. I don't want to go, but I need to go, and so just pray for us, and especially pray uh, for Sister Edna. Today I want you to think with me uh, in, in attempting to answer the question, is it worth it? And the, is it could be anything, it could be anything in your life that would come between you and God. Jesus deals with the situation here in Matthew chapter 16, and it all really, uh, I told you, would begin, the main context begins in verse 24, but it actually starts back in verse 21. So I want us to, to go back there to verse 21 and re read so it can, it leads up, especially to the last part of verse 23. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside. Peter's going to straighten him out. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. <coughs> You are a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of the earth. Where was you? Peter's mind was in the wrong place. 
He had his mind on earthly life. He, he was still looking for Jesus to be this earthly king, I'm sure. And he knew too that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God, and the far be it from him, the very idea of putting the Son of God to death. And, and from an earthly standpoint especially, uh, Peter rebuked him, but then Jesus says, You're hindering me, Peter, because your mind's on the world. Your mind is on earthly life, on, on our existence here, and your mind is not on the things of God. And we, we do that all the time in our lives. We allow ourselves to be more concerned with this life than the next. And so with that in mind, it, with Jesus just saying, you're not setting your mind, the set your mind means that it's, a, it's an intentional thing, it's a purposeful thing. You're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of, of man. Now, verse 24, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, notice there, if, it's a choice. The word if means you've got a choice as to whether or not you're going to come after Jesus. When we think of the word come after, uh, he's blazed the trail for us. He's in, the, he's in heaven now. Are we going to follow? And he will use the word follow here in just a minute. But before he does, he uses another couple of terms there that, that, uh, that help, put the, help us understand what coming after Jesus means. There are those who are going to come after us. They'll follow our example. Uh, Jesus has, has gave us the kind of example we need to live on this earth, but he also is in heaven now, and he wants us to come be with him. And we must resolve in our lives if we are going to come after him. I hope you've already made that decision. And sometimes we make that decision and then we get wishy-washy about it because the world, the things of man, the things of this earth begin to crowd us out. So if, that someone, I've, I've, told, I've told you this many times, someone has said the word if is, the big, one of the, is probably the biggest word in the English language, only two letters, but so much is, is, is conditioned upon it. If, if you're going to come after me, you must deny yourself. Here we're talking about not our, our selfish desires, our intents to do the things that are wrong, wanting it our way instead of God's way. We deny ourselves and take up our cross, which means the responsibilities of living for Jesus. That means our very... When you think of the cross of Jesus, that's where he gave his earthly life for us. And it may mean our earthly life is, is it, we have to give it up at some point. And we will give it up at some point uh, by natural causes, if nothing else. Uh, but in this life, we have, to, we have to take up our cross and then we follow Jesus. It's a decision um, that we make in our lives. And you know, there are a lot of people that don't make the right choice here. I'm reminded of Esau. Sold his birthright for a bowl of porridge or, a, or some stew or whatever you want to call it there that Jacob had prepared. Um, he probably didn't figure that it was going to come to that. I don't know. We don't know what was Esau was thinking. He just decided he was so hungry, and he said, you know, I'm, I'm, dying, to, I'm dying here. Uh, I'm so hungry, I'm going to, I'll make the trade. But I, I, I often wondered if Esau really thought it would come to that, knowing his relationship with his father. But it did come to that. He slighted his birthright. He made light of it and traded it for some food at that particular time. He made a bad trade. And in life, when we choose not to live for God... We're making a bad trade, and that's why I said we'd begin this lesson with the question, uh, is it worth it? You know, Jesus was a master at asking questions. Uh, just look at the, through your New Testament sometimes, through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, at the number of questions that Jesus asked and always the profound lesson that was involved. Anyone who was listening to him in that day when these words were uttered, and any of us today as we read these words, you can't be the same once you let, it's going to cause you to either, you know, and it's here that word if again, if I'm going to follow God or not. What will I give in exchange for my soul? And so it's that, that you know, that particular passage, that verse, verse that we just looked at, verse 26, is a sermon in and of itself, and it will change your life if you allow it to. I think of another individual that made a bad choice and decided that, this life and the things of man were more important to him than God. A young man approaches Jesus one day and says, Good Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And they begin to discuss the, 
the old covenant about honoring your father and the mother. And, 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 and he, Jesus talks about the basics of the, of the old law, which they were living under at that time. <clears throat> and the young man said, I, I've kept all these from my youth up. <clears throat> now think about it. And I've, talked, I've, I've shared this with you before. If you were looking for a son-in-law, ladies, he's rich. And not only that, he's of high moral tone. But he had a problem, and Jesus saw it. And it's back to that if question again. Jesus said, well, if you would have eternal life, go and sell everything you have and come and follow me. That's what he's telling us here. If you're going to come after me, take up your cross and follow me. And he wouldn't do it. He had great riches, and he walked away from the Lord sorrowful. And we are reminded here uh, in this incident with the young man that indeed people will walk away from God. And frighteningly enough, you have to think about this from the standpoint that you can walk away from God. It's your choice if, as Jesus begins these thoughts, if you're going to have eternal life, if you're going to come after him, if you're going to follow him, you must take up your cross as you do so. Well, as I said from the outset of this, this is a sermon in and of itself. It, it kind of preaches itself. You know, you can belabor it and... And I, I don't want to do that this morning, but I, I stumbled across something in my reading this, uh, during this past week. In fact, I think it was earlier this morning that I thought would help in, in, in basically kind of build a sermon around this particular uh, tract that I found. And uh, just let me tell you a little bit about the tract, and then I want to read something to you. And then uh, we're going to ask the question, is it worth it again? But this tract, um, or this section of this tract, come from a, a, a tract that was written back in the 1800s and published by the American Tract Society, according to the source I have here on it. And the tract itself six, was called 16 Short uh, Sermons. You can look that up on the Internet, I guess, because that's where I found it. 16 Short Sermons, and I think this was number one on the list, if I'm not mistaken. And I'm not sure who wrote the, the, this particular uh, little sermonette, um, but I do know it is from that tract, and it, it was published in the 1800s. And I want to read it to you. It's about Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24, and I want, to, I want us to read this context first in its entirety. I, I started it, but I didn't finish it. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself <coughs> and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. In other words, if this life is more important to you than anything else, that's where your emphasis is going to be and you're going to lose your eternal life, is what Jesus said, because your eternal life is not priority in your life. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. If life on this earth is not as important to you as living for God, then you, you understand what Peter didn't understand. Your mind will be on the things of God and not on the things of man or the earth. Well, he goes on to say, and this is our main text, for what, and it's a question, what will it profit a man? if he gains the whole world and forfeits his own soul. I meant to talk about that word forfeit too, and I guess this is as good a time as any. We all know in, in sports when you forfeit, you walk away and you lose if you forfeit the game. Maybe you don't have enough players to show up to play the game, but for whatever reason, maybe you, uh, for whatever the case may be, you just don't want to get out that night, it's too cold. You, you forfeit, you walk away from it, you lose the the benefit of, of, of playing and also potentially uh, of winning the game. Uh, and so you have, in essence, walked away. That's the idea of forfeit. That's what the rich fool did. He walked away from something of far greater value. How, how is it that we can do that, that we get our perspective so much on the things of man that we forget the things of God and the things that really matter, we can set them aside and push them back. And then in a 100 years, if we've done that all our lives on this earth, we'll regret it for all eternity because we've made the wrong choice and it wasn't worth it. And the, G the question Jesus asked us here and today, if you're not living for God because you're not a Christian or if as a Christian you've set these things aside, is it worth it to live that way? And many times people will say, well, I I'm going to get right later, but oftentimes later never comes for whatever reason. Well, here's what this little track said, and I'm going to use this to kind of wrap things up this morning. It's, it's not real long, but um, it's longer than something that I usually read. But it illustrates very vividly what is said here in Matthew 16, 26. 
Here's what this man, whoever he was, wrote, or person wrote. I don't know man or woman. I have a soul as well as a body. My soul must live forever in happiness or misery. It is capable of pain or pleasure inconceivably greater than my body. It is a matter of comparatively little importance whether I am an abject, an object of poverty, or he, he says it here, in whether I'm in abject poverty or, or the greatest affluence. In other words, he said, as far as my soul's concerned and in this life, and remember he says, comparing this life to the next, it's of little concern whether I'm poor or I'm rich in this life. As far as my soul is concerned, as far as a hundred years from now, it doesn't matter whether I was rich or whether I was poor in the eternal scope. Let me read that statement again. It is a matter of comparatively little importance whether I am in abject poverty or the greatest affluence. During the few years I am to continue in this present world, whether I'm respected or despised by my fellow mortals, whether my body is sickly or healthy, painful or at ease, these are matters of small consequence. Now, from an earthly standpoint, they're not. But compared to eternity, they are. And so he says, these are matters of small consequence. Death is certain. It's near. Ashes to ashes and dust to dust must soon be pronounced over my lifeless body. In a dying moment, if I could call the whole world my own, what good would it do to me? What comfort could it afford me? To be able, as in your last breath, to say, I own the world, and it be true. What good would that be if you're not ready to meet God? Well, then he com contrasts that. He said, but whether my soul is to be happy or miserable, the companion of angels and saints made perfect around the throne of God are doomed to weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth with devils and damned spirits in hell where the worm never dieth and where the fire never will be quenched. This is the momentous inquiry I ought to make. This is the question. It's either or. If. It's up to us. And he says, this is the inquiry that I must or I ought to make. To escape from the wrath to come and secure an inheritance among the saints and light ought to be my great concern. Is it so? And we need to ask ourselves a question that today, or that question. Is it so with you that you're ready for eternity? Is it worth it? If there's anything in your life that would come, that's trying to come between you and eternity. And so he, he just almost through three or four more sentences. Which world is most in my thoughts? This or the next? For Peter, your mind is not on the things of God, Peter. It's on the things of man. And you need to make up your mind. If you're going to follow me, if anyone's going to follow me, Take up your cross. If you're going to come after me, take up your cross. And so, which world is most in my thoughts? This or the next? What am I most anxious about? Am I not often inquiring, what shall I eat and what shall I drink and wherewithal shall I be clothed? He's quoting that right out of Matthew chapter 6. But when did I seriously inquire, what shall I do to be saved? If I have no prevailing concern about my soul, it may be certain my state is bad and it's danger awfully great. So today, where's your mind? Is there anything coming between you and God as a Christian today? Repent of that. Return home to God. Seek His forgiveness by confessing that you sinned and, and, and as openly as it's known, it may be something you need to correct in a public way. Ask God in, for, uh, in prayer. We'll pray with you if we need to. If we all need to pray together about it if you need to come forward. But there's nothing that's worth it. That's the, we started with this question. There's nothing worth, worth being lost or coming between us and God. Today, maybe you're not a child of God. I hope you'll become one. I hope in faith that Jesus is the Son of God, that you'll confess that belief. You'll be willing to repent of all known sin in your life and be immersed into him after confessing him as the Son of God and your belief in that, being immersed into him, baptized for the remission of your sins. So, the question comes back to this. What am I most anxious about? Is it things in this life, the things of man, 
or the things of God. And once I think about the things of God and they're most important to me, then I'm, I'm not anxious anymore. I have peace. Come today if we can help you in any way as we stand and sing together. What a friend we have in Jesus All our sins and griefs to bear What a privilege to carry Everything to God in prayer Oh, what peace we often forfeit Oh, what needless pain we bear All because we do not carry Everything to God in prayer Have we trials and temptations celebrating the great gift that he gave for each of us. King of my life, I crown thee now, thine shall the glory be, lest I forget thy thorn crown brow, lead me to Calvary, lest I forget chapter 22 we have we find the words of Jesus 
early in this chapter, they plot to kill him because they hate him. They like nothing that he does. He's stirring up trouble. And it's a plot, a political plot, to kill him. And during this difficult time, Jesus knows what's going to happen, whether the apostles do or not. So in verse 14, starting with verse 14, Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. The Apostle Paul, or, or Luke rather, writes, When the hour had come, he sat down with the, and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, With fervent desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of, the, of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God has come. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which I which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goes as it is before determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Then they begin to question among themselves which of them is to who would do this thing. As Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper here, he knows what's happening. He's trying to set up a memorial feast for him, for us as the apostles, for all of us to remember him. So we take this time of worship that we come before the Lord's Supper when many times we say let us prepare our minds as we're about to, to think of this and take the Lord's Supper we even sing a song of, of uh, design to help us think about the things that Jesus suffered. And so as Jesus institutes this Lord's Supper, this is a very important part of worship that we must remember him, his death, burial, and resurrection. And I often think what the apostles thought when they heard this, did they really understand it? And I think sometimes it's easy to go through the motions of just doing this and getting the Lord's Supper done and then I can leave or something like that but I challenge you to think seriously about this part of worship that we do according to the scriptures that we read in, in Luke chapter 22 would you pray with me Our most gracious heavenly father humbly we come before thee this morning thanking thee for all the things that you've given us we pray father as we pause for this moment in time that we remember Jesus on the cross. We pray, Father, that you would bless this bread, which represents the body of Jesus as he hung on the cross for the remission of our sins. And help us, Father, to partake in a manner pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. continue in like manner heavenly father we're thankful for the cup that represents the blood of Jesus as it shed on the cross for the remission of our sins may we father remove worldly thoughts of our mind and focus on the death burial and resurrection of Jesus and bless this father as it represents the blood of Christ in Jesus name amen This concludes the Lord's Supper as a part of worship. Another thing we're commanded to is to give as we've prospered. 
And so I'd like to read 2 Corinthians chapter 9. These are familiar passages to all of us. Chapter 9, verse 6 of 2 Corinthians says, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountiful will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. So as, we, as you leave today, we, I'll have a prayer in just a second. But as you leave uh, today, if you if you haven't done so already, there'll be someone at each door for you to give the contribution to, to continue the works that we have in place that we're continually still trying to do and striving to do. And those groups that we support monthly, uh, they continue to to be uh, given given to monthly, and so we can support those works. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the things that you give us in life. We're thankful, Father, for the opportunity that we have jobs to go to or that we've had jobs to, to do. And we pray, Father, that as we work and, and make money, that we would give back a portion to you, as the Scripture says, uh, not grudgingly, but because we want to. And help us, Father, to give cheerfully that the work of the church will continue. And also, Father, that we, as we use that money, would we use would use wisely into the things that need help? We're thankful, Father, for all the programs that we support, the missionaries and the benevolent program, all the things, Father, which come our way from time to time to support. We're thankful, Father, that we're having opportunity to do so, to do the work of your church. Pray, Father, these things in Jesus' name. Amen. last hymn, <clears throat> Sowing the Seed of the Kingdom, kind of speaks to each and every one of us. Are we sowing the seed and encouraging and helping others to find their way? Sing with me if you would, please. Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, in the morning, bright and fair? Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom? Dumb brother in the heat of the noonday's glare. For the harvest time is coming on, and the reaper's work will soon be done. Will your teeth be many? Will your gardeners in each one harvest home? Are you sowing the seed? of the kingdom, brother, all along the fertile way. Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, you must reap at the last great day. For the harvest time is coming on, and the reaper's work will soon be done. Instead of flipping on the screen right there. I have uh, one addition to our prayer list before we have our closing prayer. A friend of John Stevens, Rick Johnson, this is Travis Smith's son in law, is having severe heart problems. Uh, it's also uh, Tammy Johnson's husband, uh, who's a teacher at Alcorn Central. So I ask you to add Rick Johnson to your prayer list. Let's pray. 
Father, we so thankful for this day. Uh, so thankful, Father, for the cooler weather. Uh, uh, Father, we're looking forward to the fall and the changing of the seasons, Father. And we're so thankful, Father, for uh, this land in which you give us to enjoy. Help us, Father, to never take it for granted. Uh, we're so thankful that we live in an area where seasons are uh, changed, Father, and that we look forward to one or the other. Thankful for the opportunity we've had to be together today and pray, Father, that our worship services have been keeping with your word. And pray, Father, as we go out into the work week this week, Father, whether to work or school or whatever we have uh, plans to do, that you will bless us, that you'll keep us, and that you'll help us to carry Jesus with us everywhere we go. We're mindful, Father, of all those on our prayer list and pray that you'll continue to bless them. Ask you to play, pray. For, we ask you to be with Brad this week as he goes in for his procedure. Also for uh, Sister Becky as she has hers. Ask you to be with Sister Edna, Father, as uh, Brad will uh, not be able to take care of her as he usually does, and ask you to uh, be with her and help her and give her comfort. Father, we pray for those that have lost loved ones, many in our community and our own congregation over the last few weeks and months. Pray that you'll bless them. Father, we pray that you uh, will continue to bless us in all things. Help us, Father, as we deal with this uh, pandemic. Uh, continue to keep us safe. We pray, Father, that there will be a vaccine or... Uh, that will help us to deal with it, Father, or you will just take it away if it be your will. Father, be with this country, especially as it gets ready to uh, have an election for a new president. Pray that you will give us all wisdom as we try to make decisions on uh, whom we shall support. We love you, Father, and thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. All right, um, try to remember to do our Zoom classes this week. Uh, for our teens, our Zoom class with Terry Smith is Monday night at 6 p.m. And then our pre-K kindergarten is with uh, Patricia Dillingham and um, uh, on Sunday afternoons at 5 p.m. Young adult class with Michael Hickman's on Tuesday night. Is that 6.30? 6.30? Uh, and then uh, Zoom classes for first through third grade and fourth through sixth grade is uh, is that Sunday afternoon as well? Well, this thing's not updated, so it doesn't have Terry. All right, so. Okay, so uh, Thursday at 6.30, the uh, teenagers are having Bible class outside and under the pavilion. Okay? Do what, Mike? Yeah, first through fourth grade, Wednesday night at 6. And then uh, Lawrence is uh, Thursday at 7 p.m. for a Zoom class. And don't forget, if you want to be a part of that Zoom class, please give him your information so he, he can add you. I want to say congratulations to Anderson, Miss Kim. Anderson was uh, homecoming queen at uh, Alcorn Central this year, so thankful for her and Miss Kim and know that Miss Kim's proud. And I can see the gleam even with the mask in Anderson's eyes. So... Uh, is there any other announcements before we're dismissed this morning? Anything at all? All right. As always, will the back section back here will stand, please, and be dismissed to the rear. And then on the right side, if you guys.